I will now invite Dr. Swen to the podium. Dr. Swen will talk about the evolution of surveillance technology and its applications in the security-related forms of pattern recognition, such as iris and hand handwriting scanning. Please welcome Dr. Swen. Good afternoon, everyone. So uh, I will talk about the uh, big picture, they call it, uh, how it is done. And uh, also then I will uh, show you some the scientific aspects underlying the uh, actions of surveillance security. And then I will show you many different applications uh, such as recognition of handprints and the fingerprints, iris and the faces and the handwriting. And uh, during the talk, I will ask you some questions as well to see whether you can recognize the people I have on the screen or their handwriting on the screen. So uh, what you saw earlier uh, has to do with pictures taken from uh, the sky. Uh, for example, it could be taken by a uh, camera mounted on a plane or uh, mounted on a satellite. And uh, so essentially, uh, when a camera is mounted, uh, usually it is some kind of a photosensitive device. And uh, very often, it is a charged coupled device, uh, sensitive to light, and uh, therefore uh, it's able to capture the darkness and uh, also brightness of different parts of the earth, for example, uh, so that we can find out where are the uh, wheat fields and uh, where's the snow and uh, all these things uh, related to the earth. So uh, here, as mentioned, you can have a picture of the land, and uh, therefore you can do urban studies, uh, design, and also planning of the city, where you put the bridge, where you put the road, and where is a traffic jam, and uh, so on. So all these means once we have the camera uh, taking pictures, then we would be able to do a lot of things uh, related to uh, what the camera uh, is seeing. I will explain how uh, the camera is uh, being uh, made and how it captures the pictures. So here is in Canada, we have a lot of snow and therefore once we have taken the picture, we can uh, find how snow uh, is covering uh, different parts of Canada. And uh, essentially we can therefore uh, design and also plan on the development of the land we have. Uh, here we show a little video about the different applications we have. Uh, once uh, camera is in, equipped, and uh, therefore here you can see a parking lot, and they want to uh, find out what which cars are coming, and what are the license plates, and uh, so on. And uh, therefore here we are talking about. Uh, uh, keeping very valuables uh, in, uh, in a safe place. Here we are talking about a public park, and here we are talking about another uh, parking lot and the banking here. Uh, we see here a casino where we can capture uh, how people play and also uh, whether any, uh, any uh, abnormalities or a crime is going on. So. Here we have the exit of a supermarket, and therefore we can see uh, whether there's any uh, dealings, uh, special dealings. Here we can see the uh, products. Uh, at Concordia, I think we are using this type of uh, camera, and uh, it's called uh, 
a dome type. And uh, it, on the street, you can see a lot more uh, usually of this type. And uh, so what I would like to uh, do is to ask uh, two uh, people to explain what are the underlying uh, device that does all the uh, picture capturing of uh, the scenes and objects, uh, people, etc. And this video was taken uh, at AT&T in 1978. I'm Bill Boyle. And I'm George Smith. The image that you see on the TV screen of both of us is being produced by this small CCD camera, which is directly in front of us here. This camera was made originally for a picture phone type of application. This uh, shows what a color camera is like when you make one using CCDs. Uh, you can look inside here and see these three shiny things down here. These are the CCD devices. And they get the three colors from a prism, which is up in this area here. And this can be contrasted to a studio color camera, which is shown up. Well, these are the people uh, you may know. Uh, they are uh, one of them. Willard Boyle, Dr. Boyle, who is the person who got the Nobel Prize uh, just last, or earlier uh, last month and uh, he is the inventor of the CCD device. So the device was invented about 40 years ago, and uh, I will explain uh, in greater detail how the CCD works. Well, it goes back to many years. Do you recognize this person? So it goes back uh, many years uh, when I was uh, still a graduate student and uh, working on a device called Lexiphone, which is a reading aid for the blind, uh, trying to read with the machine on the platform here, and also uh, reading and also producing sound. So it's uh, an extremely challenging subject, but I'm very glad that I did it. And uh, you may notice that in those days, we are talking about uh, machines with only 16K. That's uh, very big already. So what we do, as you can see in the picture, uh, using Mac tapes, you see? We use the Mac tapes, as you can see here, to store uh, data so that we can uh, bring the data to the computer and generate sound. So I will explain it a little bit further by telling you how the CCD uh, works. And uh, it is certainly a very important part in what we call a pattern recognition system. Essentially, we try to uh, capture the image of an object, of a document, of the faces, etc., and uh, try to uh, find what is in there. So for the machine that I was working on 40 years ago, uh, we use a, a photocell scanner, which is a CCD device with uh, an array of photocells, and we scan the image and then capture it and then put in the uh, machine and the machine recognizes it and generate uh, voice. So this was the challenge for my uh, doctoral research. So as we move the CCD device over the printed character C, it digitizes it into uh, pixels like this one that you can see, as explained by this assistant professor of Sir George Williams University <laughs> and uh, published in Canadian Data Systems. So you can see that uh, this is how it works. Essentially, it uh, gets the 
uh, contrast between the ink and the background the paper and uh, turn it into a digital form, either one or zero in the white space, and then put it into the computer for recognition. So the character is being captured, digitized, and therefore we try to thin it and then get the geometric features and recognize it. So we were working on one letter at a time in those days. So uh, here we also study uh, fingerprints. Uh, why we do that is because even for twins, they have different fingerprints. And even for a person who becomes much older, and they still have the same uh, fingerprints. So that's why fingerprints is so important and you will see that millions of fingerprints are in custody in, at, at the, with the RCMP, FBI, and the immigration departments, and so on. So fingerprints certainly not only for security, but also for authentication. For example, this picture that you saw maybe two weeks ago in the newspaper, it's a picture that was bought by a collector in Montreal and uh, see what uh, he found. Uh, essentially, it cost him $19,000. But what happens? Claims a new Da Vinci drawing found because of the fingerprint found on the painting. And this fingerprint happens to be the fingerprint of Da Vinci. And look at the value of the painting afterwards. <laughs> $150 million. So apart from fingerprints, of course, uh, you will see that uh, either at the immigration department or uh, airport, etc., you will see that there are scanners for scanning the iris of people to identify these people. And so the iris is a very interesting part because it has a lot of features that we can capture. So once we have it captured, we will look for the pupil and look for the region of the iris as illustrated here. We have, this is the area of the pupil and uh, that is the iris. And uh, what we do is to look for these uh, circles to find uh, the positions. In addition, the color accuracy and high resolution makes Pixum powered cameras ideal for iris recognition applications. So uh, that is uh, how it is being done. And uh, at the airport or at uh, any uh, border crossing, uh, iris can be made, can be used to identify the persons and the people, and therefore we have one of them like this. Another could be in a different uh, position and uh, essentially capturing the eye. And uh, as you descend the Doval Airport coming to the immigration department, you can see there are people going to the right and where the machines are, they just put their eyes there and they would go through the customs much more quickly than other people. So once we capture the image, it doesn't mean that it is very clean and nice image. And this one could be a noisy one. So what we want to do is to clean it up so that we have pictures like this. And later on, we further uh, get rid of more noises and redundant information and just capture the most important parts of the face, such as uh, my graduate student uh, who did a thesis on this subject, uh, trying to put land find the landmarks on the face, for example, uh, the ends of the eye and uh, also the eyelids, the uh, point of the nose, 
and also the uh, s these contours of the lips so that we can identify the person and the, l the face. Apart from that, we can also look at the hand to see the shape of the hand in order to identify the person. And if they work together in a bimodal way, then it gives us a much more uh, reliability and uh, therefore uh, the accuracy is much higher. So another student in our department is working on uh, finding the expressions uh, such as happiness, uh, being happy and uh, uh, neutral and uh, also uh, disgust and uh, others would be surprised. So trying to capture the uh, landmarks on the face so that we would find the expressions of the people. So this would uh, help in identifying the mood of the crowd, for example, and uh, so on. But it's uh, very interesting. Uh, as I said, I will ask you some question whether you can recognize uh, some of the pictures. Do you recognize this person? Yes, louder. Uh, we see that there, are kick, there is a kick on his face and the covering uh, the landmarks. Therefore, if we put a machine trying to recognize this person, it will fail. But you are very smart. Some of you guessed correctly. That's what happened to him in Montreal. <laughs> Montreal is a great city. <laughs> so in our daily life, uh, when we eat fish, uh, salmon, etc., and when we buy it, it looks very clean and nice. Uh, but uh, before that, uh, some of them, uh, I would say very small portion of them, uh, could have these things on the flesh. So essentially what we have here is a filet inspection station. We capture the images and identify the locations of the worms and uh, take them out. So when it goes to the supermarket, they look very clean and nice. So once we can, oh, it goes uh, too far. So we can capture the license plates of cars, etc., uh, surveillance, and also for security. And uh, we also do a lot of uh, handwriting research, uh, recognition, etc. And uh, the upper one was written by me uh, during the rehearsal on Sunday, Sunday morning. And I wrote this to test the system. And uh, here are the results. Uh, the first one is the first choice, second choice, third choice. So it's correct one, correct two, correct three, correct four, correct five. Uh, this one is rejected by the system. And correct two, even this one was correct, the three. Uh, as I was trying to test the system, therefore I wrote some squiggles in it but still it could recognize it. As for uh, the other speaker, Dr. Capo Bianco, uh, he wrote, and uh, these are the results. Uh, you will see that it's 100%. But for this person, uh, we took some numerals from uh, his handwriting, and uh, we have this one, the first choice, uh, three, but this one was uh, different, and uh, some rejects there, rejects there, etc. So essentially, it's about 50, 60 percent correct, and uh, maybe 30 percent reject, and uh, uh, 10 percent or so misrecognition. But this handwriting is taken from the person who wrote in this p passage. Do you know who this person is? Wow. Are you sure? Yes. Such poor handwriting, 50% correct. But how much is his handwriting worth? 
So as you notice, uh, a few months ago, his handwriting was auctioned. This piece is worth $300,000. So if his handwriting is worth so much, then I would say Dr. Capobianco's 100% <laughs> would be more than $100, $100 million, <laughs> very close to the Da Vinci painting. Thank you very much.